Today I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about pyrosequencing. Um, it's also known as sequencing by synthesis. So the basics of pyrosequencing is um, it's a DNA sequencing technique done in the lab. Um, it's based on the detection of released pyrophosphate during DNA synthesis. And basically what this means is that um, as you're creating the new strand of DNA, incorporating the new nucleotides into the DNA strand, um, visible light is being generated, hint pyro. Um, so you're being able to detect this visible light. Um, the visible light that's generated is proportionally is proportional to the number of incorporated nucleotides. Um, and overall, this reaction from polymerization to light detecting takes three to four seconds, so it's quick. Um, and a lot of people do as uh, converting to pyro sequencing, or it's a new thing because no gel electrophoresis is involved, no fluorescent dyes are involved, a lot of the substrates um, and enzymes are taken out. Um, so you can see the advantages, some of the advantages. So I'm just going to talk to you just a little bit about the, si simply talk to you about the steps um, involved in pyro sequencing. What's going on when you're doing this? So the first step we'll take a look at right here um, is step one. So first you have a sequencing primer, um, which is hybridized to a single strand of PCR Amplicon. So this is a single strand of PCR Amplicon right here. Um, and this serves as the template to add these, this, the new DNA strand. Um, and of course you have to have polymerase, which is this uh, orange circle right here, to add these nucleotides. In step two, um, the first uh, nucleotide that's going to be added, uh, DNTP, so to add this, you obviously have to have a polymerase, um, and the D DNA polymerase catalyzes the incorporation of this uh, DNTP into the DNA strand. Um, and when this happens, uh, pyrophosphate, which is abbreviated PPI, is released. So whenever this nucleotide goes into the strand, pyrophosphate is released. Um, so what, what to do with this pyrophosphate that's released? We have to somehow make light. Um, in step three, this is how this happens. Um, APS, which is right here, stands for something really long. I don't really know how to say it, so we're not going to say it. So APS um, and the pyrophosphate um, are converted to ATP, which is a, is a form of energy, as you know. Um, and how this is converted, how APS and pyrophosphate are converted, is through the enzyme sulfurylase. Um, so this does the conversion to ATP. And then after this happens, through a series of events, ATP is converted to light. And this takes place because of the enzyme luciferase. Luciferase actually um, allows the conversion of luciferin to oxyluciferin. Um, and this thus generates this light. So we actually are detecting light. So light's detected by a charge coupled device and seen as a peak in the data output. Um, the height of each peak that is seen on the data um, is proportional to the number of nucleotides being incorporated. So for instance, this small peak right here, that would be one nucleotide that was incorporated at that time. It emitted, emitted that much light. Two nucleotides emitted that much light. Three. So you see how um, it's proportional. So in step four, it's, this, is, this step's more of a prevention type step. So you have the enzyme, en enzyme sorry, apparase. And this is going to degrade any un in unincorporated nucleotides in ATP. Um, so you don't just want to have DNTPs and ATPs uh, floating around everywhere. This is going to create background noise and get unwanted light that's being emitted. So apparase, the enzyme for both of these, is going to degrade these. In the last step, um, so the addition of the nucleotides are performed uh, sequentially. And as the process continues, the complementary DNA strain is built up. And the, nuclei, the nucleotide sequence is um, determined from the signal peaks in this pyogram trace. So as you can see, as it's doing these light peaks, this light peak means guanine. This means cysteine. This, this large one means there's two guanines that were incorporated. So as you can see, this goes on for a long time to sequence some DNA. Um, so you might be asking, what's the point of all this? Why do we care about pyrosequencing? Well, there are several applications specifically for pyrosequencing. Um, it's a relatively new technique, so it's not to its furthest, furthest potential, let's say that. Um, but a few applications for pyrosequencing are genotyping of single nucleotide polymorphisms, 
So um, each allele combination will give a specific pattern compared with two other variants. So you can distinguish between homozygous dominant people, between heterozygous, very simply by just looking at the peaks. They're different. Um, also another application is mutation detection, kind of on the same basis of the of this genotyping, um, is that the variation in pattern that you get, so there should be one pattern for, say, this gene in your family. If it's mutated, it appears this way. So you can easily see that on a, um, on a data plot. Another, the last uh, advantage I wanted to just speak about for a second is microbial typing. Uh, pyrosequencing is being used to rapidly t uh, type a large number of bacteria, yeast, and viruses. And not only are they typing these, they can actually, the pyrosequencing is straining these bacteria. So, so it types them into one bacteria and then it can give you a specific strain of that bacteria just by pyrosequencing. So you can see some of the advantage of pyrosequencing. Um, I have a PowerPoint attached to let you guys see exactly what I went through today. Um, and I hope you learned a little bit about a new form of DNA sequencing called pyrosequencing.